want to begin this lesson by asking you to think within yourself uh, and answer the question, which I'm pretty sure that you do have this, but do you have standards? Is there a standard by which um, you will live your life? A lot of times when we talk about I have a standard of living, I have, this, I have a quality of life that I want to live. But what if I asked you, do you have a standard in your life? And I was, I've been thinking of this for, just for a, a little bit today. And I, I kept thinking, what is the definition of the word standard? How, I know what it is, but what can I say using words to make, to define the word standard? And uh, I found this definition. It's an idea or thing used as a measurement to model uh, evaluations. And that's just a long way of saying that I have a, there's a limit to what, to where I can, what I will take, what I won't take. But, needless to say, I think we can all say we do have standards. In other words, there's some things that we will put up with to a point. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, having a standard is also prevalent in the New Testament. One of the themes that is used in, uh, uh, in the New Testament, one of the themes in the New Testament is salvation. That's probably the major theme that we find as we study the Bible. But there is another theme in the Bible, and that theme is righteousness or righteous. What does it mean for a man to be righteous? Well, personally, I think that means that there is a standard, there's a limit. But what does it mean for you and I to be righteous? Does it mean that we are pure in heart and not in actions? Does it mean that we are pure in heart and in our actions? Are we pure in heart when it comes to God's law? Are we pure where it comes to justice and honesty and virtue? Are we true in our religion to God? That's, that's basically it in a nutshell. And so, as we think about our spiritual life and we say, we answer the question, am I righteous? Let's ask another question. Is God righteous? Is God a righteous judge, a righteous God? Notice what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. Paul writing here said, Put off concerning your formal conduct form the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. As we see this text, what does it mean that according to God in true righteousness, When it applies to God, the, the perfection or holiness of His nature is righteousness. That's the definition when it comes to answering the question, is God righteous? And then we, another, uh, another way to ask this, is God correct in how He reacts or acts or His behavior? Well, everything that God does is correct, isn't it? 
This morning, we looked at the word perfection and how that can be applied to our life. Here, we see in this text that God is perfect and God is righteous. There's another text I want us to look at briefly, and that's in Psalm 71 and verse 19. Also, your righteousness, O God, is very high. You have done great things, O God, who is like you. In other words, who, who could do anything like you, God? You are righteous. You're correct. Everything that you do, everything that you say is, is proper and right. So tonight I want to ask, answer and discuss the thought, and this is the theme of this lesson, is God righteous? Or discuss the thing that God is righteous. Now, because God is righteous, I'm going to live by a standard. A while ago I started this lesson off with talking about what type of standards do you have. When, when I asked you that question, did you think about religious standards? Did you think about the standard that God has already set forth? There's a limit to what God will, uh, that what I want to do. I do not want to supersede God. I don't want to step over what God has done. So I have a standard. I have a limit to what I want to go. I don't want to push myself to step over it. I want to do exactly what God has said. But today we are living in a time when the, the distinction between right and wrong, good and evil, is becoming increasingly blurred. It's almost as if you live the way you want to live and I'll live the way I want to live and then if you get in my way, I will take care of you and you just have to put up with it. We see this in our society. We see this with what is going on in many cities of our country. But what is right and wrong, what is good and evil, is becoming so misdefined by attitudes of people. Our societies have adopted the, the concept of what is called situation ethics, which means what is morally right varies from person to person. What you say is morally right, I may not agree with it. And what you say is morally right, I may not agree. But what we're leaving out of, out of the translation is what God says is morally right. God's standards, dear friends, have never changed. They've always been the same. It's been the same in the Old Testament and it's the same in the New Testament. He has never changed His standard for the Christian. Now let's consider the law of God. What do they do? The law that God has given us in, in, in Scripture reflects His very nature of who He is. His righteous right nature. Now remember the definition that we discussed just a few minutes ago about God's righteousness, God's behavior, and, and God's laws are perfect and they're correct. If God can see into the future and know everything that's going to happen in the future, when He gave those laws to man to obey, do you not think that He already knew that man was going to object to them? We're told in Romans 3.22 or 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Did God know? Yes, God already knew that. So therefore, there is a standard by which God has said, you've got to do something in which to be forgiven. And that thing is the gospel. As a child of God, we must hold to the righteous standards, the correct standards that God has established if we expect to be approved by God. In Psalm chapter 5 and verse 12, the psalmist says, Oh, for you, O oh Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him with a shield. You notice the psalmist is letting, letting us know there is a, a limit to God's standard. He doesn't, man is not to supersede that standard if we want to be protected by the shield of God. So we live by standard. And that standard is God's law. You know, when we think about it, 
we, we live also by the standard of the laws in our country. And we can understand that and we can do it. And even though there are some who break the law, there are consequences to breaking the law. Sometimes it may be that you are caught by the police speeding and you have to pay the, the ticket. I was watching this afternoon, just kind of resting a little bit after I got back from the Christian care. I, I was able to do a, a sermon, a worship service there this afternoon. And when I got back to the house, I just kind of sat down for just a little bit. And I was looking at a, a program that I watch kind of often. It's, uh, it's about the game wardens out of the state of Texas. And... Texas has a standard when it comes to fishing and hunting and things like that, much like every other state. And this particular game warden was patrolling his area, and there were two young boys, out, not young, they were young men, uh, young adults, and they were fishing. And he, uh, this game warden walked out to where the guys were fishing, and he says, hey, did you have, have any luck? Well, yeah, just a little bit. What did you catch? And they told him, and, and he said, well, let me see the fish. And one fish was undersized. There was a standard for what you could keep and what you had to throw away when it came to fish. So he said, uh, we got to, this has got to be thrown back, and I'm going to issue you a ticket for this. Where's your license? Well, I don't have one. You don't have one. No, I don't have it. Well, there's a standard in the state of Texas that you've got to have a license to fish. Well, I had one. Why is it that when people get caught with their hands in the cookie jar, they got to lie? Yes, children lie when they get caught. But hey, you hear the, the cookie jar clanging. Are you in the cookie jar? No, mama. But yet their hand is in there. Why is it that when you get caught with the police and he says, where's your license? Well, I left it in the truck. Do you have one? Well, no. They can check and find out if you have a license or not. They just call in your name over the radio and you're, you're, you're going to get caught. Another guy who was caught uh, red-handed uh, with a deer when he did shooting a deer and, and harvesting a deer, and he didn't have a license to do it. But he did do one thing. After he shot the deer and cleaned the deer, he did go buy one. So he went and bought a license, but it's too late. You already shot the deer. And that license is it has a, a, a time stamp on it, so the, so the game warden knew that he didn't have a license when he went hunting. You see, there is a standard in everything. And if you break the standard going to suffer the consequences. So we have a standard, and that standard is God's standard. But God's righteousness, God's righteousness, His very nature of God is absolute. There is no room for negotiation when it comes to God. God's way and God's thinking and God's uh, way of wanting us to do things is absolute and correct. He's correct in his thinking, in his laws. Nothing changes. In Psalm chapter 71 and verse 19, the psalmist says, Also your righteousness, O God, is very high. You have done great things, O God. Who is like you? No one. Let's answer that question right now. No one is like God. No one supersedes God. No one comes before God. God sits in heaven and He looks down and He rules man out of righteousness. And His rules have been published. They've been put in writing for you and I to study and to read and to see what we need to do. In Psalm chapter 145 and verse 17, the psalmist says, They shall utter the memory of your great goodness. Let's stop right there a moment. There's another text in, in the Bible that says, Remember the things that were written aforetime, for they were written for our learning. 
That kind of goes along with this. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness. As we go back and we study the Old Testament, we see God's goodness all through the pages of the Old Testament. Even though there are times where God gets very angry and God punishes Israel and punishes other people, He is still uh, loving and caring and kind in that He makes a way for them to return to Him. How many times do you remember in the Old Testament when, when Israel has sinned and they repent of that sin, they cry out to God, and God says, okay, if you do this, I will forgive you. One particular time I remember where, where uh, the children of Israel were very wicked, they were sinning, and God sent a bunch of snakes into the camp. And, and these snakes killed many people. And the people cried to Moses. And, and Moses went to God on the people's behalf. And God said, okay, I want you to make a brazen serpent. I want you to put it on a pole and raise it up so that if anyone has ever bitten, if they wanted to live, they had to look at that snake. If you were in the children of Israel's camp and you got bit by this snake, would you look at that brazen serpent that's raised up? Apparently some did, but some didn't. God made a way for man to live then. And God's made a way for you and I to live in eternity with Him. But that's His standard. We've got to accept it. At the very end, when this life is over... <coughs> And we stand before God Almighty. We will be judged by God's righteousness. Think about that for a moment. God has already said what He wants. God has already put into writing how He wants us to be. And when we stand before God in judgment, we're going to give an account of the things we've done in this life. And the Bible sometimes, in one place says, even the secret things we've done, we will give an account. And that account will be based on the standard in which God has already established. Nothing's going to change. When you go there and, and, and if you know God's standards, if you know God's law, and you know God's rule, when you get to, uh, when you get to uh, judgment and you've done everything that God has said to do, you've obeyed the gospel, you have worshipped acceptably, and you've been... Uh, to services and you supported the church and you, you did everything that you were commanded to do as a Christian. When we get to, to judgment, you can stand there and, un, and know and believe that the standard that God has set will not change. You did it. I said it. You did it. That was the standard. And that's what we're going to be judged on. But if you haven't met the standard, when you stand before God and give an account, He's going to say, Look, I set this standard. This is what I wanted for you. Why didn't you meet it? It's not difficult to do. Why didn't, I, why didn't you grow up and, and act like, you're should, like you should act? Why didn't you get to the point where you are a child, where you would be one of my children? <clears throat> just like with Israel, I made it a way for you to live with, if you got bit by just looking at that brazen serpent made a way for you to come and live with me for all eternity, but you had to meet my standard. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, Paul, is he's, he knows the end of his life is coming. And he says, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. There's the standard, friends. Paul understood that there was a standard based on God. There is a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who love His appearing. If you look back down and look at verse, four, uh, verse 6, as Paul is beginning to know that his time is short, he says, for I am being, already being poured out I'm already being poured out as an offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. 
I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will give me on that day. Now what is Paul saying? Paul is saying that I've lived up to the standard that God has set. And because I've lived that standard, I'm ready to die. I am ready to give up my life. I have nothing to fear. You know, there's been times in my life where I've been scared. One time is when I was in the Navy. My very first cruise in the Navy, as a matter of fact. And as we were traveling from Yakuska, Japan, where our home port was, out to the Indian Ocean, to where the outside of Iran, this was during the Iranian crisis in the um, early 80s, we were trying to get there and with due haste. And we had nuclear bombs in the hangar bay. I was on a, a aircraft carrier, and, and there was only a certain way that you could go to the forward part of the ship and, and the aft part of the ship. There was two, only two ways. And as we're going through a small strait outside of Singapore, our, our ship had a collision with another ship. The flight deck was being flooded by jet fuel because all the aircraft that were on the left side of the flight deck, the back side of the aircraft were chopped off from the other ship. And all you could think about during that night was, we're going to die. That's all I could think about. I was scared to death. General quarters was called. Everybody went to the general quarters station. And what kept going over in my mind is, I'm not ready to die. Not that I'm not ready to I'm not prepared. Paul said that I am already being poured out for a drink offering for my time of departures at hand. I have fought the good faith. I have done what I need to do. I have not. And so I was scared. There have been times where I have been through tornadoes. And I'm so thankful that we don't have tornadoes here. Every time a storm pulled up in the state of Alabama, there was a tornado warning. I get scared with tornadoes. I get scared with snakes. Most of you know that. I don't get scared of the tornado like I used to because I know that I've met God's standard. And I don't have to worry about thinking, I hope I'm ready. I can sit there and I can say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will give me to, uh, on that day. And not only to me, but you, everyone in here who loves His appearing. That's meeting God's standard. Go with me over to Matthew chapter 25. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25 quickly as we start to wrap up this, this lesson. Matthew chapter 25 and really beginning in verse 31, we see that Jesus is talking about the end of time. And uh, He says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on, his, on the throne of His glory. Jesus is going to judge us. All the nations will be gathered before Him. And He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand. And the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous 
will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and come to you? The answer to that, friend, is when you met God's standard. But notice what else God and Jesus says. The king will answer and say to them, As surely I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. You met my standard, so enter into this heavenly home. Then, verse 41, he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer him, and, and saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, and sick in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will say to them, saying, Surely I say unto you, inasmuch as you did not, do it to one of the least of these. You did not do it to me. And these will go into everlasting torment, but the righteous and eternal life. Two classifications of people here. One who met the standards and one who did not. I don't know about you, friends, but on the day of judgment, I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joys of life. That's what I want to hear. Friends, God is righteous. We're told at many places in Scripture. God is a righteous God. God is a loving God. But God's way that He has given us, His standard of our living, is a very righteous way. It's what He wants from He knows what is best for us. Why is it that man questions God when God knows what is best? I was just thinking, I mean, something popped into my mind right now as I was uh, closing this sermon out, there was a... I, 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 was, still, I was too young to, to see it when it was on television, but there, I remember seeing some reruns of it when I was growing up. And that was the program, Father Knows Best. And isn't that true? Our Heavenly Father knows what is best. He knows what is good for us. Just like our, our earthly parents know what is good for us. Just like the elders of our congregation know what is best for our congregation. Just, just like uh, a preacher knows what is best to preach to help the congregation. God has a standard and He expects us to meet it. God's, God is righteous. His way is righteous. But more than that, His commands are, are righteous. The question is, will I be righteous by following God's way and His commands? If so, we can hear those words, well done. But if not, we're going to hear the words, depart from me. It may be that there are some here tonight that needs to obey the gospel or neither or either come back to God in repentance and ask God to forgive us, to forgive them and to ask for the prayers of the church to help them overcome sin and overcome temptations. I, you know, it, it could be that way. But whatever it is, we will we help. We want to help because we are family. We are here to help one another. Go from this life to the next life of heaven. But if you need to respond to the invitation, do it now. As together we stand and sing.